nice and sticky and humid outside. Right? <laughs> yeah. And I think it's only going to get worse. Um, <laughs> regardless, uh, you know, actually, we just got back from China. A few of us were there. Um, raise your hand if you just got back from China. Yeah, 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 yeah. All right. Um, so, again, uh, feel free to talk to us about the trip. I'm going to talk a little bit about it today, but um, we've been trained to explain to you one thing we've learned within two minutes or less. So, this is something that Sam drilled in us so you can test each other. If we go over two minutes, you can just, you know, just walk away and be like, ah, oh, I blew it. Um, but regardless, um, we had a great time, and I'll be sharing just a little bit about that. But, um, you know, again, I thank you guys for coming out and just. Uh, yeah, I hope you enjoy this time in the Word together. Um, I actually was planning to show you a couple of video clips, but unfortunately, um, uh, Apple and, and PCs don't get together um, very well, so we're going to have to work on that next week. But we did have a couple of greetings from some of our uh, missionaries on the field um, that some of us haven't seen for a long time, so I'll share that with you guys next week. Um, but really for today, we are jumping back into the, the you know, the, the, the schedule that we've been going through, um, you know, this year we've been we've been talking about the new life. We spent the first six months on on the book of First Corinthians, and we're challenged by how the church was being called to stand firm, to stand against what the world was telling it. And in many ways, that's a continuance of what we will learn as we go through the Old Testament. So we're going through actually the story of Joseph, and um, very soon we'll be starting a series on the book of Daniel. And um, both are examples of, of men of faith who stood firm against the difficult situations in their lives. And we're hoping to be encouraged by that and be challenged to live life once. So, um, unfortunately I can't show those videos, but regardless, without a cloak. So, how do you guys deal with success? When you're doing well at something, you know, like, how do you... How do you respond? Do you like to share with others about your success? Do you want them to, to join with you in, in, in seeing how successful you've been, right? Um, or is it something that you kind of try to keep quiet about and you don't really want people to know? Um, the question is, how do you deal with success? Now, I know for, for many of us, we come from very different upbringings, very different backgrounds. So uh, again, our, our culture has a lot to do with, with how we respond. Um, I think from a very Asian perspective, you're not supposed to brag. Right? Asians, very, like, they don't like it when you brag about yourself. You can brag about your siblings or your family. Parents always brag about their kids, right? Like, it's kind of crazy how much parents brag about their kids because they're allowed to. But you can't brag about yourself, I've noticed. Um, you know, I've talked about this before, how like, you know, like SNU, Seoul National University, is the number one school in Korea. Um, and like, I know students that go there. The, the thing they used to say is when you ask them where they go to school, they're like, oh, kyang, nakseng de kakon, hakyo. So it's like a, a school that's close to like a subway station nearby. They don't say what school it is, even though everyone knows what school they're talking about, right? Um, but I think it's I think like I've said before, I think society is changing. Because now we have these letterman jackets that tell everybody what school you go to, what your major is, what year you enter. And like, you know, it even has like, like, you know, like really funny things written on it that in America, people would laugh at you if you wore that, honestly. Um, because those jackets that you wear, they're popular when you're in high school in America. Right? So if you're wearing that as a college student, people are like, what's wrong with you? Just wear a t-shirt, come on. <laughs> anyway. Um, in the West, it's a little bit different where you're actually kind of encouraged um, often to revel in your glory in many ways. That, that people can come off as, as somewhat cocky and arrogant because they like to explain to each other how great they are. Regardless, we all come from different backgrounds, and so how we deal with success is differently. But um, I wanted to look in this passage on how Joseph dealt with some of the success that he had. So we're going to read all of Genesis 39, so if you'll turn with me in your word, or open up your smartphones, or uh, just look at the screen above, we're going to read from Genesis 39. Word of the Lord says this, Now Joseph had been taken down to Egypt. Potiphar, an Egyptian who was one of uh, Pharaoh's officials, the captain of the guard, brought him from the Ishmaelites who had taken him there. 
The Lord was with Joseph so that he prospered, and he lived in the house of his Egyptian master. When his master saw that the Lord was with him, and that the Lord gave him success in everything he did, Joseph found favor in his eyes and became his attendant. Potiphar put him in charge of his household, and he entrusted to his care everything he owned. From the time he put him in charge of his household, and of all that he owned, the Lord blessed the household of the Egyptian because of Joseph. The blessing of the Lord was on everything Potiphar had, both in the house and in the field. So Potiphar left everything he had in Joseph's care. With Joseph in charge, he did not concern himself with anything except the food he ate. Now Joseph was well built and handsome. And after a while, his master's wife took notice of Joseph and said, Come to bed with me. But he refused. With me in charge, he told her, My master does not concern himself with anything in the house. Everything he owns he has entrusted to my care. No one is greater in this house than I am. My master has withheld nothing from me except you, because you are his wife. How then could I do such a wicked thing and sin against God? And though she spoke to Joseph day after day, he refused to go to bed with her or even be with her. One day he went into the house to attend to his duties, and none of the household servants were inside. She caught him by his cloak and said, Come to bed with me. But he left his cloak in her hand and ran out of the house. When she saw that he had left his cloak in her hand and had run out of the house, she called her husband's servant. Look, she said to them, this Hebrew has been uh, brought to us to make sport of us. He came in here to sleep with me, but I screamed. When he heard me scream for help, he left his cloak beside me and ran out of the house. She kept his cloak beside her until his master came home. Then she told him the story, this Hebrew slave, or that Hebrew slave you bought us, came to me to make sport of me. But as soon as I screamed for help, he left his cloak beside me and ran out of the house. When his master heard the story, his wife told him, saying, that is, or This is your, how your slave treated me. He burned with anger. Joseph's master took him and put him in prison, the place where the king's prisoners were confined. But while Joseph was there in the prison, the Lord was with him. He showed him kindness and granted him favor in the eyes of the prison ward, well, warden. So the warden put Joseph in charge of all those uh, held in the prison, and he was made responsible for all that was done there. The warden paid no attention to anything under Joseph's care, because the Lord was with Joseph and gave him success in whatever he did. Amen. This is a story that many of you should be familiar with. Um, I'm sure for those of you that, that grew up in the church, that, that you know went to Sunday school, although they might not have gotten into all the details, this was a story many of you heard from, from a very young age. Um, but, but there are a couple things I want to highlight from it. But just to review, we've been going through the story of Joseph. We look back at, at um, the baby wars that happened between his own mother, um, Leah, and, or not, no, Rachel was his mother, sorry, between Leah and Rachel. Um, and, and we talked also about how, you know, the, the encounter that he had with his brothers when he shared about the dreams that God had given them and how he caused jealousy and how they sold him as a slave. And we were really touching upon how much of this, because remember, Joseph is a fourth generation believer. Much of his situation has to do with the things that happened before him. The generational sin, particularly the sin of favoritism, is what caused his brothers to hate him so much. So much so, that they sold him as a slave. You know, for, you know, I know what's, what's kind of big right now is people are, are very against human trafficking. You know, Joseph was trafficked by his own brothers, right? Um, now, a generational blessing. Again, Joseph is a fourth generational believer, and the blessings of the forefathers before him have passed downward. And you see favor, and you see this is how he's able to overcome and prosper, even in these difficult situations. And that's what we're seeing in this passage right now. So, there are two major points that I'm going to keep touching upon, and I'm going to start right now. There are two things Joseph does in this passage that I want us to really pay attention to. The first thing is, he never took credit for his success. Throughout the passage, it's always written that the Lord was with them. The Lord was doing these things. And we'll talk, we'll talk about that in a second. But the other thing that he did a great job was, he stood against temptation. He stood firm, even though he was continuously tempted by Potiphar's wife. So there's two things that we can learn from Joseph. And really, when we get to the story of Daniel later on, you're going to see a strong correlation. Daniel is doing the same types of things. He doesn't take credit, and he stands firm. Now, one of the things that's very interesting thing is, is remember, he's a fourth generation. The first generation was Abraham. 
And God had made a promise to Abraham in Genesis 12, where he says, I will bless those who bless you. Of course, he said, I will make, you know, I will bless you first so that you can bless others, but I will bless those who bless you. And we saw this first with, um, with the story of Jacob, when Jacob is, is serving his, uh, his uncle Laban. Laban is prospering. Now we're also seeing it in this text as well, that God blesses Potiphar because Potiphar was blessing Joseph. Okay? The favor of God, it, it's, it transfers to those that don't even believe in God, that they can enjoy prosperity because of the blessing, that promise that God had made through the Abrahamic covenant that he will bless others through us. And we see this in the story of Potiphar. And one of the things this passage makes very clear, and I actually forgot a verse. There was one, I think, toward the end, verse maybe 24, 25. It repeatedly says that the Lord was with him over and over again. It says it at least four times in this passage. What the text is trying to make very clear is that even though Joseph is going through struggles and difficulties, God never left him. And brothers and sisters, that's true for all of us as well. God will never leave you or forsake you. But to get to that first point, now this is very interesting because when we first saw Joseph a couple weeks ago, and we saw kind of this really bratty kid, he was 17 years old, and he was, you know, he had this, you know, this multicolored jacket that his dad had made him, and he was just showing off. He was flaunting the, the favor that he had from his father, and he was telling all of his, his, his brothers and his parents these dreams that he was having that they were going to be bowing down to him. Right? There's an irony here. Joseph was not a humble person at a young age. But we see that because of the suffering that he's gone through, you start to see that he, he's living a life of humility. So much so that scripture says in verse 3, when his master saw that the Lord was with him, and that the Lord gave him success in everything he did. It doesn't say that the master saw his ability. It doesn't say that that Joseph was very gifted at different things. He might have been. But the way it's written was that the Lord was the one doing these things. And the Lord was giving prosperity and success. So much so that this person that did not even believe in God, Potiphar, saw that the favor of God was on this man. Think about that for a second. Potiphar's household was being blessed by this man so much so that Potiphar had to recognize this man was special. Not necessarily because of who he was, but because of the God that he worshipped. That's very interesting. Because actually, that's, that's very challenging to me when I start to unpack that and think about that. That we can actually be a blessing to other people, so much so that they will actually see God in us and recognize that God is doing something through this person. What an interesting way to be a witness. And we also see that when, you know, when, when he, he's going through the struggle and, and he's arguing with, with Potiphar's wife, he has no allegiance to the master, his allegiance is to God. When he says, my master has withheld nothing from me except you because you are his wife, how then could I do such a wicked thing and sin? Not against Potiphar, but against God. Interesting. Joseph recognized the reason why he had success. He recognized the, the reason why all these great things were happening. It's because of God. He wasn't taking any of the credit for himself. And he wasn't crediting it to his great relationship with his master Potiphar. No. He knew that the, the reason why he was being successful and the reason why he was, he was blessing this household so much was because of the, of the God that he worshipped. Again, I can't help but be challenged by this. Because you look at this and first off, Joseph was dealt a very bad card in the sense of being sold as a slave by his brothers, right? I don't think any of that us, of us have gone through that kind of hardship yet, <laughs> right? Um, 
you know, I, I, I joked about, I didn't joke, but, you know, my sisters did torment me as a kid, and I shared about that before. But, you know, it's nothing compared to what happened to, to Joseph, right? <laughs> they messed with my head, but they didn't sell me as a slave. Or try to kill me, right? At least not that I'm aware of. <laughs> but in the midst of this, what we're seeing is Joseph's response to this is more maturity. He's actually getting past that, that adolescent stage that we saw him in where he was very immature. And now he's a man of humility and a man that actually really believes in God. So much so that the favor of God that is in his life, he's using it to glorify God. He is not taking advantage of the favor of God in his life. That to me is... Again, a big challenge. Now, the, the reason why I, I share it this way is because, I, as I've shared before, I identify a lot with Joseph. Um, among the characters in the Bible, I identify with him a lot because, like him, I am a fourth generation believer. And like him, I see more of the generational blessings in my life than the generational curses. Right? In many ways, I feel like I am the product of of the, the faith of my forefathers. And I think Joseph would agree to that in many different ways. And in the same way, like I said before, I was tormented but not sold as a slave. But, just like you see in this passage, Joseph was having success wherever he went. You see it first in Potiphar's household, but then you see it next in this prison. <coughs> wherever he went, God blessed him. Brothers and sisters, I experienced that same type of life where wherever I went, I just felt the favor of God. And kind of like Joseph, Joseph, wherever he went, they put him in charge of everything, right? That happened to me too. Wherever I went, any church that I went to, first Sunday, they'd already be asking me like, you know, when can I take over the ministry or whatever. <laughs> it was almost to that extent. And it's like, it's not like I ever sought out these types of responsibilities. I remember when I was um, I was an intern um, in Kansas City. This was back in 1998. I'm dating myself by saying years. Um, for some of you, you're like, oh, he's young. Some other you guys are like, oh, he's old. Um, but regardless, um, 1998, I'm an engineer intern, right? I go to Kansas City. I go to this very small church. It was the only English ministry among all the Korean churches there. I show up there. I'm 19 years old, right? They, like, it's funny, I remember this one little high school girl who was like, maybe like, only three years younger than me. She's like, are you a doctor? <laughs> no, I'm still in college. <laughs> but immediately, like, I was kind of, I became one of the main leaders of the singles ministry, not the college ministry. I was actually in the singles ministry because I was working, right? So I, I couldn't relate with the college students anymore because they were studying. Me, I was working as an engineer, so I started hanging out with these singles who were, you know, in their 30s and whatnot, much older than me, but I became one of the leaders of that group. Doesn't make any sense. I was only there for like three months, and they still remember me. Um, you know, I go to Texas, and I, I just graduated college. I go to Texas, and immediately I show up, and, and I go to a church where it's mostly just college students, and then there's a gap, and then there's just like married people. What had happened was they had they had kind of become independent from a Korean ministry. And then um, as they got older, they got married, and then the, the singles that weren't married felt awkwardly left. So you had this ministry where it was a bunch of college students, and then a big jump, and then it was a bunch of like married, married families with kids, right? I show up, and they're asking me to take over the singles ministry. And I'm like, what singles ministry? I'm the only one, all right? <laughs> And next thing you know, I, 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 I'm leaving the singles ministry, and then I end up taking over the campus ministry, and, and all these things were just basically handed to me. And it's not like I was looking for this type of responsibility. But the funny thing is, the favor of God came, and He showed me what to do. Without any training, I was able to lead these different groups. Now, funny thing is, like, you know, when I come to Korea, it's a different story because in the States, no one really knows who I am. But in Korea, all I have to do is say who I'm related to, and all of a sudden, everyone's, like, bowing down to me, right? 
you don't know, my uncle planted this church. So everyone, like, the moment I say to them, oh. But then they, like, then they, they get all excited, and they start asking me questions, and then they find out I'm not married, and then they're like, what's wrong with you? <laughs> <laughs> so Korea is a different, different story. But it, it opens a lot of doors because of my, you know, because of my heritage and my family. But for myself, just like Joseph, I experienced the favor of God in my life a lot. So much so that I couldn't take credit for the things that God was doing. But the challenge that Joseph shows me, and oftentimes, like, it's very easy to start to think, wow, I'm good at this. Wow, I have such great ability. It's very easy to start thinking that way. And it's easier still when you're living, especially in America, where you're taught to think that way. You're taught to glorify yourself. But the challenge that you see in this passage is Joseph did not misuse the favor of God. He instead turned that favor of God and made it to glorify God in, in return. That's a challenge. Because for us, as we encounter success, it's very easy for us to pat ourselves on the back. And it's very easy for us to say, you know, I did a good job. But Joseph never did that. He lived a life in such a way that people that didn't even believe in God were like, wow, I don't believe in God, but if there is a God, he's doing something crazy through that person. That's a challenge. So that's the thing I want you to, to really question yourself with is, as I experience success through my life, how do I actually glorify God through that, rather than glorifying myself? Now, I, I do want to note that for some of you, you might be on the other side of the story where everything's hard. Granted, you know, like I said, I, I relate with Joseph, except for marriage. Um, and so so for, 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 like, for some of you, everything might be a struggle. And I would say there are other characters in the Bible that you can relate with. Someone like, say, David. Most of David's early life was a struggle. He was running for his life until he was like, about 33. But regardless, I know this church, I know the people that come here, and I look around in this room, and I see people that have experienced a lot of success in their lives. Peter was joking with me that he, he was surprised that there were actually a lot of smart people at this church. <laughs> South Kansas. <laughs> but there are. There are people here that have every right to be proud of themselves, but the challenge is, how do we glorify God through us? Now the interesting thing is that with success often comes temptation. On one side there's the temptation to glorify ourselves. The other side, it gives us opportunities to indulge. And I think, as I mentioned David before, he's a good example for because even though he experienced a lot of hardship, he eventually did experience a lot of success. And the story of, of, you know, David's biggest downfall was when he decided to indulge in his success. You know, the story about Bathsheba where, where he commits adultery and then ends up having a man killed because of that? It was because he was deciding to indulge himself by not going to war. The passage says clearly that it was the time of war. David was supposed to be out leading his troops, but he was just hanging back at the palace looking around, seeing naked women, <laughs> and then doing stuff about it, right? He was indulging himself. And in many ways, for those of us that experience success, temptation almost automatically follows. Now, with Potiphar's wife, um, here's a couple of interesting facts. So, so Joseph, when it, when it says he was well-built and handsome, it's actually the same exact Hebrew phrase that's describing his mother, Rachel. In Genesis 29, 17, the very same word, so it's like, like mother, like son, right? Rachel was, you know, she was a biblical hottie, right? <laughs> so Joseph, he had good genes. The translations are very different. I think hers said she was like, like fine of figure and all this stuff, and it says well-built and handsome form. But it's actually the same exact Hebrew words. They were good-looking people. Regardless, um, when, when she says, come to bed with me, Potiphar's wife, when she says that over and over again, it's actually only two words in the Hebrew text. 
So she's very, being very curt and very just like, she, she's not trying to talk him into anything. She's just being very coarse with him, right? Uh, which actually kind of reminds me of, of uh, Joseph's father, Jacob, in terms of, of his desire for Rachel. There's, there's a parallel there, I think. But regardless, you have this woman that is pleading with him to sleep with her. So he has this temptation to indulge in himself for someone who's been doing such a good job. Now, in my imagination, I am assuming that, that she was a beautiful woman. Because honestly, if she wasn't, this wasn't much of a temptation. <laughs> but, but my thought is, Potiphar was a very high official. He was someone who was just below Pharaoh. Most likely, she was probably a very beautiful woman. So like I say on the bottom, the temptation was real. <laughs> and yet, he stood firm. Verse 10 says, And though she spoke to Joseph day after day, he refused to go to bed with her, or even be with her. So this was a constant temptation that she kept throwing in his face, and he went as far as to create as much separation from her as possible. He went above and beyond in trying to stand firm against this temptation. And the interesting thing about all this stuff that happens, now, now to go back, um, when, when it talks about the cloak that, that she grabs, um, for some reason, I've always had this imagery of that being the only thing he wore. And then like, like he's running around naked, right? For some reason, I've always had that imagery that probably wasn't completely true. Um, the, the cloak was just most likely an outer garment, so he probably had clothes underneath. Although I like the imagery of naked. <laughs> Joseph running away. Um, not that Joseph, but anyway. <laughs> so, one, one thing to note with that is that by leaving his cloak behind, he probably knew that he was gonna get in trouble. Right? He wasn't dumb. He knew that by, by, by letting that go, that it likely meant he was going to get punished. Now one of the things that's interesting is that you see Potiphar is angry, but you don't necessarily see that he actually believed his wife. Because if he did, he would have had Joseph killed. That was the penalty for adultery. Especially for a slave. If a slave sleeps with your wife, you just execute them. Instead, he sends him where the text says, to a prison where the king's prisoners were sent. Now again, I'm using my spiritual imagination here, but when I think about this, it probably wasn't that bad of a prison. Think about it. Like For people that, that commit very high, what they call white collar crimes, they go to minimal security prisons. Like, it, it, like people actually, people actually complain about this, that some of the prisons that these very, um, these kind of white collar like criminals go to are like resorts. <laughs> that, that's a complaint in America. Like it's like it's like nice, right? And that's kind of what this text to me tends to intimate is that Potiphar he knew he had to do something because it was basically her word against his. But it seems like he sent him to the the least likely place where he would be mistreated. So I, I really think that Potiphar didn't completely believe his wife. He just knew that he had to do something. But what we see is that even though he goes from a very favorable position, Potiphar was a very high official, he was a, a man that was treating him well, it was a good place for Joseph. And then he sent to prison. But the passage says four times that the Lord was with him. And the interesting thing was that the reason why this was all allowed to happen is because God had a greater plan. If Joseph had stayed with Potiphar this whole time, he would have lived a very comfortable life, but he would never have gotten into the position he does later on. Joseph had to go to this prison because this was the only way that he could actually go straight to Pharaoh. And we'll see that in the next week. So for those of us that are in, you know, encountering struggles, are encountering difficulties, and are wondering why God is not allowing us to, to follow the path that we thought He had marked for us, in many ways, He might have something even greater in, in store for you. In many ways, His path is actually going to lead you to a place where you can actually be even more effective. So, the two main points, don't take credit, and stand firm. 
Now, I want to talk a little bit about China, so I'll try to do this as quickly as possible. But one of the things that I really saw there was it's a closed country, right? You're not allowed to freely proclaim the gospel. Um, you know, you can get in prison for these things. It's not as bad as it used to be, right? We don't we don't have to worry about smuggling Bibles or anything. I think you can just buy a Bible anywhere you want there now. Um, but at the same time, you can't just do whatever you want. And I know for, for me it was it was funny because. For Yenji, Yenji doesn't feel like China to me. Because it, it, historically, it used to be a 60% um, Chosunjo population, so Korean Chinese population. It's down to about 30% now, but even so, every single sign is written in Chinese and Korean. And then everywhere you go, you hear people speaking like Chosunma, like the old version of Korean, like old style Korean. So much so that like, if I really needed to, if I just spoke Korean, I could probably survive there on my own without any Chinese. So I kept having to remind myself, I'm in China, I'm in China, I'm not in Korea anymore. But I felt like I was in Korea. But, and, and, and the reason why I had to remind myself I was in China, because in China, we don't have the full freedom that we do here. Sam was warning us, he's like, they're monitoring everything, like, everything's being recorded, you gotta be careful what you say. So we were speaking in this like kind of code, except like it was very confusing because like for us we would get we would confuse ourselves. And then some of the some of the missionaries we would talk to, like, they would complete speak in a completely different code, so we're like, what? What are you talking about? Um, like it was a very simple code. It's basically you had to say M instead of missionary, you had to say P instead of pastor or pray. Um, so I know uh, what? Dick and John and Eric used to joke like, hey, let's pee together. <laughs> <laughs> and so, 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 you know, we had these different codes that you weren't supposed to say church, you were supposed to say club, and, and, and all these different things. Um, and and I, kept, I kept getting confused, because some people would use this and some people wouldn't, right? Regardless, what we saw mostly there was what they call business as missions. And for most people in the mission field, because you can't actively just be like a traditional missionary, you generally have to create a business. Um, many people would call this tent making now, um, but, but basically most of the missionaries over there were actually going there under the guise of a national business. Um, and, and so it's, it's a different model than, than kind of what most people think of when they think of missions. But it's one that we saw at different levels. We, 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 one of the coolest things was we got to meet 10 different missionary families. And they were all doing very different things. And it gave us a very broad spectrum of how God is working there. And it was awesome. But some of these were at different stages in their ministry. For some of them, their businesses were failing. There was one group we were talking to where they, they might have to shut the doors like the next week. Like it was that dire. And then there are, there are others that we actually saw that were prospering like wonderfully. Um, a, a funny thing is there was like, well, there was like a, a coffee shop there um, that's originally kind of more of a, a mission-led coffee shop that has kind of become the Starbucks of, of that part of China. You know what I'm talking about. Um, so, and, and, and some of the missionaries were complaining that it's gone away from its original point, right? It had become so successful that it just was a business. It wasn't really a mission anymore. And so just like in, you know, just, just, just like Joseph, you have that issue of how do you deal with the success? Let's say you run a business. Now most of these businesses were struggling. But let's say your business takes off and it does well. How do you juggle that success with the work that God actually has in store for you? And so for me, I love Chick-fil-A. And so I wanted to give you an example of, of some type of business that, in my opinion, is, is, is doing some things right. I took this from the website. This is their, their statement of purpose. It's right on the website, Chick-fil-A, it says, now for those of you that don't know Chick-fil-A, Chick-fil-A is a fried chicken franchise in America, probably one of my favorite places to go to. Um, it's routinely like rated number one in, uh, in America for favorite fried chicken above like KFC or Popeyes or anything like that. Um, in their website, their statement of purpose is to glorify God by being a faithful steward of all that is entrusted to us, to have a positive influence on in all who come in contact with Chick-fil-A. That's a very bold statement to put on your website. For a public company, 
And one of the things that everyone knows about Chick-fil-A in America, they're closed on Sundays. And for whatever reason, the only time I've ever seen the one Chick-fil-A is on a Sunday. So I'm driving and I go with them like, yeah, Chick-fil-A is like, duh, Sunday, <laughs> you Christians. <laughs> I don't know why that always happens, but it always happens that I want to go to Chick-fil-A on a Sunday. But you would think that being closed on Sundays would put them at a disadvantage to all other fast food chains. But they are one of the most successful in America, easily. And you know, like it's weird. Like you go there, and it's like the happiest place in the world. Granted, they're playing Christian music, so that helps. But it's like everyone who's working there is like the nicest person in the world. I've never gone to a Chick Fil A and gotten bad service. Right? They're so nice. One of the things I actually heard was that um, for most franchises, if you want to build a new franchise, you have to spend a lot of money. Like Subway is one of the number one franchises in the world. Um, this is outdated information, but when I heard it was, if you wanted to open a new Subway, you needed to put down about $2 million for the franchise fee. Very expensive. But once you pay that fee, then they would send all of the material, and it would be very easy, but you still have to put up $2 million to open up a Subway. What I heard about Chick-fil-A is that their franchise fee was almost negligible. It was something like $50,000 US. But they do a very extensive background check on anyone that wants to open a franchise. Um, because they want to make sure that you have very strong moral character. And so for them, their value was making sure that the people that owned their businesses were people of high character. And they didn't care about the franchise fee. Where Subway, they just wanted to make a lot of money. So they just put $2 million and like, okay. So I found that very interesting. But regardless, the reason why I wanted to share this is because this is one of the examples where I feel a Christian-led business is actually doing things in a positive way that actually glorify God. Granted, maybe they could do some things better. I don't know. Um, I, they did get in trouble back in 2012 because of comments uh, the COO made about um, same-sex marriage, uh, which is interesting now that all the other things that have happened since then. Um, but regardless, I, I wanted to give at least an example of ways that you can be a business but can actually bless the community. Now, unfortunately, Korea has a very famous Christian company, Eland. I don't think they're, they're doing it right. <laughs> I don't hear anybody say anything positive about that company. Um, but regardless, just like an individual, a business has the same issue. How do you deal with success, and how do you stand firm against the temptation to change? I'm sure Chick-fil-A in the early days, there was a lot of temptation to open on Sundays, right? And they stood firm. And so I think for, for any of us in that type of situation, for us to lead a Christian organization or business, how do we deal with success and how do we stand firm against temptation? So I want you to think about that on an individual and an organizational level. But more importantly, individually using that example that Joseph placed before us, how do you deal with the success in your life in a way that glorifies God and not yourself? And how do you stand firm against the temptations that come through that success? So let's take a moment to pray into that and go ahead and close for today. First off, I just want you to take a moment to look back in your life and look back in, in your success and hardships. And I just want you to to look into seeing God's hand in all of that. So much so that, that you'll actually see that He was the one giving you favor. He was the one enabling you to succeed in the things that, that you thought you were doing on your own. I just want you to take a moment to look back at your success and failures and to see where God was in the midst of all of that. Let's take a moment to pray.
Yeah. 